Oh, good morning. <laughs> Snuck up on us, didn't it? Apparently we're on. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to your Pathway Home. This is Matthew Allen with Jim Gershon and Kane Atkinson. Good morning. Good morning. Howdy. We are so glad you're with us. Thank you for joining us today as we study together. It is our pleasure to be with you, and we see a number of you joining in from around the country this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of the program. This is a work of the Kettering Church of Christ. We meet at 4600 Bigger Road here in the, the Dayton, Ohio area. We'd love to have you join us today if you're in southwest Ohio. Our services begin at 9.30 this morning for our children's devotional and Bible classes, and then we'll meet at 10.45 for our worship services today where we have praise and prayer and preaching. And we want you to be a guest with us today at the Kettering Church of Christ. Hope you can join us for that. Check us out on the web, KetteringChurch.com. So guys, how, how are you this morning? I'm awake. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm hanging in. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're with us. Very blessed. And we are excited to spend this time together this morning studying the Word of God. And we want to remind you that we are live and that uh, you can participate in the program today. Uh, just type out your Bible question or comment on the screen below. We will... Uh, we will try our best to answer your question uh, live this morning uh, on, on the air. Again, just type in your comment, or if you're watching us on YouTube, um, we want you to tune in uh, there, and you can send us an email, yourpathwayhome at kettering.church. Again, yourpathwayhome at kettering.church. So join us and be a part of us and participate with us. We'd love to hear from you. So guys, um, one of the things that we, we want to talk about this morning, I think that uh, we had seen kind of come across our, our uh, feed. Jim has a news feed, a religious news feed that he, he's a part of. And, and it was really kind of struck our attention, and we thought it would be something that uh, would be something worthy to share with you. But this is actually from a blog article written by uh, Lisa Childers, um, from two or three years ago, according to the source of information we have, and somebody reposted this uh, a few weeks ago, but the title of the blog article is Five Signs Your Church Could Be Heading Toward Progressive Christianity. And, you know, I think sometimes when we, we, uh, we look at some of these things, we think, well, that, that really doesn't apply to us. Uh, the churches of Christ are a long, long way away from, from this, and I just beg to differ. I, I think these are things that we need to be aware of, as we study together and look at the pages of God's Word, look at how the culture is going, uh, because uh, things are headed away from a respect of God's Word. And really, as we go through these things this morning, guys, one of the things I, I want to really stress is the respect for God's Word and holding it where it needs to be in the scheme of things. Well, the biggest problem we do have is uh, it, the, the invasion of humanism coming into into our society, yes, and, and the attitude that they have towards God's word in general. <clears throat> so this article is pretty important, and and you'll always hear people use the terms a liberal or conservative <laughs> or old fashioned or progressive. These are these are terms that have become common in in our in our, the world that we live in, but it becomes a problem when we stop looking at what God has said and start looking at how we want God to be. And, and Romans chapter 1 deals with the concept that they changed God to meet what they wanted him to be. They forgot about God because they didn't want to, uh, to retain those things that they knew about God. They didn't want to retain it, and they didn't want to listen to it, and they didn't want to follow it. So what they did is they gave up the real God, and they started replacing him with things that would better suit their need. And we run into this problem in religion all the time. We have it in society. Let's rename marriage. Let's rename, uh, let, let's, let's make marriage be between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. God defined marriage, not society. And, and we don't define marriage. God defines marriage. And that's such an important thing for us to remember. God defines marriage, and we can read about it within the Scripture. And when man starts doing that, we have a problem. Yeah, and I mean, we, we hear that word progressive, and it does have a positive connotation, right? It sounds like, you know, we're getting somewhere. We're, we're moving forward. 
But I think we, I mean, I believe in pressing on the upward way. I believe in progression too, progression toward heaven, going on the, the pathway home, but progressing toward the other location for eternity is not a good idea. So you just need to be careful, make sure that you're doing what God's word would have us to do. So guys, one of the things that is important here as we look at this article, uh, we're talking about progressive Christianity and, and, and where a lot of churches are headed, uh, one is this idea that there's a lowered view of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in these cases, you might hear people saying, well, the Bible's written by humans and, and it's just a human book. It's not really that big of a deal if we think it's inspired. And really, it comes down to uh, what do you mean by inspired? Uh, that's one of the other things that this blog, point, blog post points out. But people will say sometimes, well, I disagree with the Apostle Paul and his, his teaching on whatever issue that it might be. Or, uh, you know, the Bible contains the Word of God, but it's not the Word of God. And so yeah. in some places you will, you will hear these types of, object, of objections and assertions made. And so the question really comes down to it in this way. Uh, what... How did the first century Christians regard the Word of God? Yeah. And I want to take you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 for a second. The Apostle Paul is uh, praising the Thessalonian church for their respect for God's Word, for the way they held it up. And he, he says here in verse 13, We thank God constantly for this, that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so when you take that verse, 1 Thessalonians 2.13 apart, you, you really focus on it. What is Paul saying? And, and really, and specifically here, what is he saying about the word of God? Uh, he is saying it is divine in origin, and that he as an apostle, as well as other apostles, delivered this divine message directly from God through the Spirit to the believers of the first century. And they recognized that. They saw that there was something different about what these men were teaching. Not only that, it, it, they, the same message is throughout the New Testament. When you go to Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul makes this statement. Assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of the grace of God that was given to me for you, how... The mystery was made known unto me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Paul refers to the fact that God inspired him, the Holy Spirit came into him and delivered the message. And I, and I hear people all the time say, oh, well, yeah, well, any man would say that. But let's just think about this for a second. If you believe in a God that has the power by speaking his word to create the universe, <clears throat> are you telling me that that same God is unable to give us his word so that we can understand what he wants us to do? That's kind of choosing God the way that you want him. Mm -hmm. And I know there's people challenging the concept of creation, but that's because they have no faith. Everything that we deal with in life is created. Matt's got a nice paper cup here. It didn't just happen. Somebody figured out how to make that and how to put it on the assembly line and put it together. That's all a product of mind. And everything that we see is a product of mind. And we know a God that is so powerful that through his word, he spoke the world into existence. Yet we deny the same God the ability to get his message to us. Paul said, when you read, I have been inspired by God and God's word has come through me that I could write it down that you could have the, my understanding in the mystery of Jesus Christ. And when people in the pulpits and throughout churches in this country say that just isn't so, then what you're saying is we really can't know what God wants. Do you believe that God is that powerless to let us know what he wants? Well, here's the deal, I think. And we've talked a lot about this here at Kettering over the last three or four months, and that is the idea of postmodernism how it is impacting the church, and I uh, want you to just think about uh, broaden your perspective, what's going on in the, in the greater evangelical world with this, and, and we have a lot of popular teaching right now that is afraid to stand up on object, objective, substantive truth, mm -hmm. right, okay? Yep. And, and we are afraid in the culture to, to stand <laughs> up for some of these things and make, make 
proofs and claims that this is right, this is wrong. And we, we can do that with the Bible because we believe and teach that it comes from a divine source. It comes from something that is beyond uh, the human realm. And therefore, uh, because it is above us and beyond us, uh, it has authority over us. And that's, that's what we, we uh, when we look at the message of God's word, we treat it that way, we treat it objectively. And we can read it and understand it and apply it and I understand that in the world today, that is not popular, especially when it comes to uh, morality and religion. Uh, it has kind of permeated over into, uh, oh look, my whole life, uh, it's, it's really been growing. I can remember as a child, uh, in thinking about all the different uh, denominations in the world, my grandfather used to tell me, he was a Methodist, he would tell me that that we're all, all the different churches are like spokes in a wheel and that we're all just headed toward the same place and we're all going to get to heaven. And that, now that, that, because when we would talk to him about differences in theology or differences in doctrine, that was his standard answer. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so and think about how that, that was a popular belief and you might still hear it in certain circles today uh, or derivatives of that, that line of thinking. But it, it really, think about how that has blossomed into what we have now. Oh, yeah. We can't know any truth. Well, the ecumenical concept. But you know that, how silly that is? Even in nature, you're going to Atlanta today. Just choose any road. You'll end up in Atlanta. Now, if you believe <laughs> if he chooses any road, he's going to Atlanta. Well, I did know. I did know a guy once that was from St. Louis, and he was going to Dallas, and he was in Indianapolis. So... Uh, yeah. Impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, and it, it just it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Especially yeah. when Paul teaches that there is one church, there and, and there is one faith. He, he doesn't say there's many faiths and there's many churches and all lead to one thing. The the fact is the saved are in God's church. Yeah. That that's what the church is. It's the body of the saved. And the scriptures lead us to understand God's will that that puts us with him in that body. And the world doesn't believe that anymore. The, the ecumenical concept is, oh, well, we're all, we're all headed in the same direction. No, we're headed in different directions because one group of believers believes that the Bible is authoritative, objective truth. And a lot of people think, well, it's just a book. Do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish? You know, do you really believe it? I'll give these miracles. You really believe that? Oh, yeah, I do. I do because the God that created the universe can prepare a big fish and swallow a man and keep him alive for three days inside of him. If you don't believe in that, you don't believe in who God is. And, and you put him down in terms that we can understand as human beings. And that's, that's the problem. We want to make God like us. So let's, let's yeah. think about some of the issues of our day, okay? And we have some very pointed difficult issues concerning morality that have become very controversial in, in our world and teaching objective truth on these matters is one that is problematic for a lot of people and to take a, 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 a clear, concise stand on the Word of God is difficult for many. And you will hear them say, well, you know, I, I just disagree with Paul on that. Uh, Paul mm -hmm. uh, was a chauvinist. Paul... Uh, didn't like this, Paul didn't like that, and, and I, you know, I just disagree with him. And here's the problem with that, okay? I want you to look at Paul's claim in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. Who is Paul? What is Paul's mission? And what, what is, and, and where, where did his authority come from? Okay, here he is, he says, I am an, this is Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, you know, you think about the introductory verses to most of the epistles, I call those flyover verses, yeah. because yeah. we typically don't read yeah. those, we just kind of fly through them, we don't realize the rich uh, doctrinal truth that can be found in some of these verses, and Galatians 1.1 1, 1 is one of those. Who is Paul? Paul says, I am an apostle, not from men, nor through man. But I am an apostle through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Okay, Paul is making a very uh, truthful 
objective statement as to who he is and the things that he's going to be disseminating in this letter to the churches of the of Galatia come directly from God with authority, right. all right? And, and so when we have this same letter and we begin as a Christian to make the application, we need to understand this is writing of a divine source and it has authority and bearing over us today. And it will until the Lord returns. Yeah. And, and to, to both of your guys' points, I think what mankind likes to do is, you know, you see that in this, the story of the golden calf. We like to create our own God because that's something that we can, we know the dimensions of it. We can touch it. We can hold it in our hands and we can control it. And it's terrifying for us to come face to face with a higher being that we don't understand the dimensions of, that we can't fathom the greatness of. So um, how do some people respond, and, and what is our temptation? We, wanna, we want something that we can control, that we made. Um, and when you shift your view toward the, I'm, I'm using the quote-unquote progressive viewpoint of religion, then what you have is you have a complete embracing of the golden calf theology of let's just, let's just figure this out for ourselves. Um, I, I once was in a Bible study with someone, um, and I had the same experience as the author of this article. Three months in, oh, I don't even believe the Bible's 100% true. Well, then what are we doing here? <laughs> what is the point of this, all this yeah. conversation we've been doing? So then I had to, we had to go back and start talking about how the, the Bible proves itself by way of prophecy. And so it's, it's just kind of a mess to untangle. And it's only, the thing is, it's only one area or angle of assault that, that is coming to the, the true faith of Christ right now. So we need to be able to have answers for these things. And they are to be found uh, in the scriptures themselves. Well, Cain, I appreciate you bringing that up because there are a lot more angles to this. One of the ideas that we hear today is that Christian doctrine is something that's open for reinterpretation. Yeah. Yeah. And and mm -hmm. and so we've we've got to we've got to be aware of that. How do we how do we handle that? How do we respond to that? Um, it, sometimes people will say, well, the resurrection of Jesus doesn't have to be factual to speak truth. I don't even know what that means. Yeah. Okay. Um, or that the church's position on immorality and sexuality is something that's archaic. In other words, it's outdated and old. It was for a different time. Uh, and it needs to be updated within the modern framework. You're, you're actually having people uh, make those claims. And, and look, this is happening. Okay. Again, I think typically we... Um, we think, oh, there's no way that's happening within the churches of Christ. And I, I want to I wanna beg to differ with you. Uh, right now, on some of the college campuses across the country that are affiliated loosely with the churches of Christ, you are seeing some of these things being said, all right? Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that hell is real and eternal is offensive to some, all right? Even those doctrines are being being. Um, uh, uh, you know, proclaimed. And so this idea that doctrine is something that's open for interpretation, um, we've got to be careful when we make those types of claims. What does the Bible say? All right. There's a passage in Jude 3. Jim, I think you're over there, right? Yes, I am. Jude yep. 3 that I think is very, very important that talks about the exclusivity of biblical doctrine and the timelessness of biblical doctrine. Yeah, it, it, it says, Beloved, Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The, the faith is once de, was once delivered unto all Christians, unto all those that are, are children of God. And, and, and it doesn't go changing. One time for all times is what that concept is. And, you know, and I, I have some empathy because I have a lot of friends that are of different faiths, and, and even some of them, uh, this week I thought of them, some, some of them of the Catholic faith. And, and here's what the problem is. Uh, what we see is now the Pope has said that uh, unions between same sexes is okay. And that's what he said. And so there's going to be friends I have that are in the Catholic faith that are just absolutely going to disagree with that. And, and they say, that's, that's not possible. So, and you're absolutely right, because God deals with marriage as between a man and a woman and actually strongly condemns anything that we are now saying that is okay. 
But it's not just that one section or one thing that religions are teaching wrong. All of you, no matter what faith you're in, you need to look for the faith that was once delivered unto all the saints. Saints, and that's found within the pages of inspiration. If, if God created the world and just said, well, I'm not going to give you any way how to live or what to do, that would be silly. He created us because he loved us, and he wanted us to know what holiness was. He wanted us to know what was good and what was right and those things that we should know. And the Bible reveals all that. And when we walk away from the Bible, the sense of right and wrong goes away with it. And, and standing upon the Word of God for what we practice, what we believe, that's the only source of where we can derive faith. And I think one of the most important verses in the Bible is Hebrews eleven six. Mm -hmm. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For in coming to Him, you must believe that He is, and He rewards those that diligently seek Him. Well, how can we seek Him if God hasn't given us a word to know how to seek Him? Are we just going to make it up in our minds? God's given us the message. He's given us the pathway. He's given us the word that we can know him. So we want to know what you guys think about all this. Uh, mm -hmm. Several of you have tuned in this morning, and, and uh, we see Nathan uh, writing in this morning with some good comments. And a number of you uh, have told us good morning, and, and uh, we appreciate that. But we want to know what you think about what we're talking about. Uh, how, do, how do we respond to all of this as, as, as going forward as as local churches and as Christians, where we mm -hmm. we are interacting with our friends and, and acquaintances out there in the world, uh, you know what what is our course of action uh, as we move forward uh, in in time? Additionally, I'd like to encourage anyone who's listening who maybe has never thought about these issues uh, or never perceived them as maybe a, an issue or a threat. Um, if, if you're in a, a, a different denominational group today or, or if you're, you're just out there in the world kind of outside looking in, we want to encourage you to kind of look at this and examine the consistency. Um, this is not a, a personal assault on any of these uh, members of these churches, of course. Um, this is not a, uh, an attack on their character, but, but we just want you to earnestly look and, and test all things like it says in Thessalonians. Um, and. Uh, if we're if we're headed, if we're progressing, but we're progressing uh, in a in a downward spiral, we need to we need to try and cut that off of the past and stop that process. Again, we want you to make it to heaven. You know, again, I think a lot of this is just rooted in uh, the idea that we don't want to offend people. Yeah. Okay. And when I when I read blog posts like this that are identifying some of the problems we're facing, uh, what the, if I were to summarize it up, it is just the fact we have a, a segment in our culture that identify as Christians that are afraid to stand up, okay, for, for biblical truth, uh, maybe because there is a dominant uh, idea out there that the Bible's not inspired. Listen, I, I uh, finished up a, a religion study degree, uh, soon to be three years ago. I had four years at Wright State and studied religion from the state school perspective. Um, mm -hmm. which is an interesting way to go because in every single one of those classes that I had at Wright State, the viewpoint of the Bible was it's just a book. Yeah, It's just a book. There's nothing special about it. Yes, it is the core of uh, Judaism and Christianity, the Judaism primarily for the Old Testament. Christians look at it um, in, in a different way, obviously, from the Jews. But the idea there is, is that it's just a book. And it's filled with flaws, it's filled with errors. There are copies of copies made and errors made and one person borrowed off another person. And, and, and uh, I mean, I, the, the, the last class, the, the, there was a class I had in the last semester on the New Testament Gospels. And I, it was just mind blowing yeah. uh, to, to see how uh, secular scholars approach the word of God and that, um, uh, there were just uh, that the the, 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 the the idea that these men that wrote these books just made it up. Hmm. Um, that was a prevalent uh, thing that was taught in that class, and I, I was just shocked, just totally shocked. The idea of God-filled inspiration was nowhere in that, and so. Those are very powerful, learned people that have done a lot of study. They carry a lot of weight with what they believe. And so there are a lot of people in Christianity that see that, maybe intimidated by it, don't, don't want to deny uh, their education. And so 
well, uh, we want to hold on to Christianity, but we want to frame it in that light, and so we'll, we'll compromise. You know, I, I think it's really important that we call uh, things as they really are. Uh, there, Satan uh, is not content with us believing what God says. He wasn't content with Eve, and he's not content in the world today. Uh, he asked Eve straight out, did God say you should not eat of that tree? And she said, yeah, we're not to eat of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. That's what God said. And then Satan said, that's not what he really said. This is what he said. And so what happens is everybody creates God in the likeness he wants when his word's right here in front of us. You know, Rich said in a passage um, from Psalms chapter 27, and verse 5, and here's, here is our, our verse 8. And here is what the writer says on this. He says, he says, you have said, speaking of God, seek my face. My heart shall say to you, your face will I seek. <laughs> now, so God creates his creation and says, seek me. Seek me. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Mount, seek and you'll find. God is pleading to us to seek him. And he's given us the source where we can seek him. And he says, seek my face. And people of faith say, I will seek you. And, and so if you're going to go about to seek God, you need to do it by what God says. And the other thing is people uh, have, have minimized the scriptures and made the statement, made the statement, well, you know, the Bible's inspired just like, you know, I read another book and that inspires me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that inspired, no, 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 that's not it. When it says, when Paul writes to Timothy that all scripture is inspired by God, that word inspired mean, uh, that, what it means is it's God breathed. The scriptures that Paul has is directly breathed from the mouth of God. That's inspiration. Uh, Matt doesn't have that kind of inspiration. I don't have that kind of inspiration, except when we're speaking directly from scripture. Then we have that type of inspiration because God, through the apostles and the writers of these books, inspired them. And so people fight that all the time. But if you have no guide, if God left man here without a guide, how weak is that God? And that's not the God of creation. I, 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 I want to tell you guys, uh, I'm breaking the fourth wall, but there's two guys behind the camera right now. I went on a hike with them for 15 miles. I, they're smiling. He's still dragging. <laughs> it's true. I, it's, yeah, my calves are destroyed. That was months ago. But, <laughs> but you can imagine, all right, we're going to go out and we're going to hike 15 miles. And I go, okay, we're going out in the woods for 15 miles. Do we have a map? And then, you know, Colin looks at me. He goes, yeah, but there are some part of it that I just don't agree with. Am I going to trust him <laughs> to lead this hike? Absolutely, Over a cliff. absolutely <laughs> not. We're going to end up in the. I'm going to use a Kentucky on a term. We're going to end up in the Briars, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, so that that's kind of what these uh, religious leaders that are bringing their churches toward progressivism. Uh, yeah, we're gonna. We want to bring you closer to God, but we don't really know where we're going. We'll see where it shakes out, right? We'll see what the flavor of the week is this week, and that is, to me, that defeats the entire purpose of having a faith in God, because that, that, that's what God offers is stability and truth and consistency and uh, hope. But in that model, you could be right off a cliff the next day and you, you just have no idea what part of the Bibles are true and what isn't. We don't know. Yeah. You know, I really like what Kim wrote in about as far as uh, having uh, possession of the truth. And listen, we have truth. Yes. Truth is there. All right. We're living in a world that's like Pilate. What is truth? Yeah. But we know that we have truth, and it's the Word of God. And we need to hold that Word of God up and understand that it is what supplies and fuels our faith. Here's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And that, that is real. That is tangible. That is something we, we bank our lives on, all right? And, and uh, you know, we do it despite the, the, the realm of, of politically political correctness. Yeah, well, and that's another area, Matt, that we, we don't have time to go into today, but yeah. but see, what, what the world has done is they've taken Christianity and tried to make it sociably, socially yeah. acceptable and fit the social issues of our day. 
and, and Jesus in, in Matthew, the 26th chapter, and, you, and we can talk about this later. He says, the poor you have with you always. That's just the nature of the world that we live in. There's going to be people that are poor. And that doesn't mean we don't care about them. But the factual, the factual statement is that Jesus didn't come to take care of all the poor people in the world because they're always going to be there. Jesus came to give those poor people life and give yes. it eternally. And we get wrapped around the axle about yeah. taking care of social issues and trying to use the Bible as a guide for social issues. Uh, you know, we have to have food kitchens. We have to have this. We have to have that. we got to take care of their physical needs. Well, that's great. That's great, but that's, that's not what Jesus came in the world for. Yeah, he didn't, the, the mission. The mission. The gospel. Yeah, the mission yeah, is saving the lost, getting them from this world into the next world. And sometimes... When you listen to the people out in the world, you think that Jesus was a, a, social, a social warrior. Jesus was a God warrior. Yes. That's who Jesus was. Look. He was an eternal life warrior. That's who Jesus was. Yeah. I, I, think it, I think it just needs to be said. I, I think kind of the, the intentions behind some of this stuff is somewhat noble, right? Like we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. We don't want them to have... But, 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 Remember in Acts 2, those people were pierced in their heart because they realized that they had sinned. And if, if we remove objectivity, there is no sin in that equation. Think about Jesus in his time. What you hear in progressive, uh, the progressive Christian narrative is times have changed. I disagree. Sin was there then, and it still is here today. Yes, it, there are different issues in different forms, but... You think they weren't struggling with sexual immorality back then as an issue? Look at the Greco-Roman world. Yeah. That was still an issue yeah. then. And so it's not that uh, Jesus is ebbing and flowing with the times. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's going to be the same forever. And that's just the matter of fact truth of it. And I'm not saying that to offend anyone. That's not my primary purpose with that at all. That's not my directive. I want people to understand that there is a pathway to heaven. And that, that is Matthew. And, and that is, Jim, that is the mission of the church and, and of Christians everywhere. And it will offend people. Yeah. Christ, Christ knew that people would be offended because of him. And that doesn't change the message. Uh, people are going to be offended by us talking about what Jesus was talking about. And that is that life was in him. Eternal life was brought into this world through Jesus Christ, the gift of God's grace Amen. for our redemption. And, and it's not about solving all the problems of the world. I'm not really worried about climate change. It happens. <laughs> what I'm worried about is the change that we need to make in our hearts and in our lives so that we glorify our Creator, and someday we can all be together with Him. And that's, that's the important thing. I love what Kim writes here. Truth must be upheld always in season, out of season. And, and look, uh, there are going to be times that we're going to be out of season. It's not going to be in style. It's yeah. not going to be popular. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still must be dedicated uh, servants of God, driven by faith. And as Hebrews 11 one says, the assurance, the absolute assurance. And we have all these internal claims uh, written by the apostolic writers. They were men of God, messengers of God, disseminating divine truth that has authority over the lives of those, uh, over all mankind for that matter, but the lives of Christians, all right, and to whom it was written. And, and so uh, we, we live by that. We hold that up as truth. We, we stake our eternity on that, you know, on the promises that are, that are, that are therein. And so Christianity is, uh, really involves our deliverance. That's the gospel, yeah. our deliverance yeah. from sin, our deliverance from death, and, and the promise that when we die, we're going to wake up on the other side. Yeah. You know, before we leave this morning, George put up a nice comment on, on how, how we have 66 books in the Bible and written by 40 different authors, and, and the harmony is God's love for man. Man fell, the harmony of God getting man back to him forever. And a nice verse by Kevin, he, he sent to us this morning. We love reading what you guys are saying as, as we do this because it does. It flows. It helps us flow with the concept of what we're trying to get across. And you're helping us do that. So thank you for watching.
and thank you for participating. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, um, as you leave, we get ready to leave here today, and maybe you're thinking, maybe something we've talked about has sparked something within you, maybe a topic you'd like for us to discuss. Send us an email this week, mm -hmm. yourpathwayhome at kettering.church. Again, yourpathwayhome at kettering.church. We check that email all the time. We would certainly love to hear from you. Guys, uh, before we wrap up this morning, uh, one of the things I, I didn't get to at the beginning of the program is uh, we have a, a special weekend coming up here uh, one month from now. Uh, we're going to be talking, uh, we're having Brother Art Adams from the northern Indiana area, South Bend, Indiana area. He's going to be coming to Kettering. And, uh, uh, Brother Adams is a, a licensed psychologist and Christian counselor. And we're going to have some very relevant and important lessons over the span of three or four days here. Uh, we'll have our normal services on Sunday, March the 8th, and then services Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week at 7.30. But we're going to be talking about topics like anxiety and depression and how Christians can, can respond to that. Topics like dealing with the addiction of alcohol or drugs and prescription drugs and being dependent on, on substances. How do, how do we respond to that as, as Christians? How do, we, how do we get help with that? Uh, we'll be talking about the problem of pornography. Uh, probably 60 to 70 percent of the men in your congregation are either addicted to it or have had this problem at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exaggerating on those statistics, by the way. You know, it's, it, is, it is the real deal. We're going to be talking about that uh, uh, during, this, during this, this time together, Brother Adams. And so that is March the 8th through the 11th at the Kettering Church of Christ. Here in a few days, we're going to have some information up on our website where you can refer to that and get more information about it. But we want you to be making plans for that as, as we, we, uh, we do that. And I will tell you, Art Adams is very, very good. Yeah, very yeah. good. He knows so, what he's talking about. So uh, we have come to the end of another program. Gosh, we're moving up on 100 episodes. Oh, yeah. It's hard to believe. Um, when is so, that? The first of March? Yeah, it's coming up. Yep, yep. And many of you have been with us all the way. We appreciate that. We'll be talking more about that as the weeks go by. So thank you for joining us. We'll be here, Lord willing, next Sunday morning, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Hope you can join us. Until then, we hope God blesses you.